Good evening and welcome to the Faculty of Law's Virtual Open Day and to the St. Augustine campus of the University of the West Indies. My name is Winnell Gregorio and I am the Director of Marketing and Communications here at the St. Augustine campus and I will perform the duty of host to navigate you through our proceedings. We have this with us this evening parents, we have guardians, siblings, we have some teachers and of course we have you, our future students. Thank you all for taking the time to spend with us this evening and for giving us the opportunity to share more about this great West Indian tradition called UE. A special welcome also to the members of our extended management team from the campus who have joined us this evening. Today we highlight the Faculty of Law, a faculty which exposes students to substantive legal principles in a wide array of topics. Throughout your university career, you will develop advanced analytical and critical thinking skills and certainly this faculty will teach you how to craft compelling arguments in resolving legal dispute among many other things. UE St. Augustine law students come to understand the components surrounding the social dynamics of power, appreciate fine nuances, contours and distinctions and begin to rethink the status quo, an invaluable asset which provides lifelong skills beneficial in a wide range of professional endeavors. So here's an idea of how this evening's program will flow. We will begin with brief remarks by the Dean of the Faculty, and then we will move into learning a bit about the field of law, a bit more about it. We'll also learn about the faculty itself, the programs of study that are available, and the career options that you can look forward to as a graduate. You can share your questions throughout the session via the chat box and after the formal presentations, we will transition into the Q&A section where a team of representatives from the faculty will address your questions and your concerns. So to kick things off this evening, let us know where you're locked on from, if it's Trinidad and Tobago or Caribbean islands or further afield. Put it in the chat, let us know where you're from so we could Hail you out as well. So as we progress, I now invite our Dean of the Faculty of Law, Professor Rosemary Bellantoine, to give you her welcome remarks. Good evening, Dean. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the University of the West Indies, and in particular, the Faculty of Law's Open Day. And as a budding lawyer, you would no doubt have done your homework and know that the University of the West Indies is the number one university in the Caribbean and around the 5% globally, according to the Bull Rankings. We're very proud of that. And we hope to entice you to join our law family. With me this evening are some of my colleagues in the faculty. We have Deputy Dean of Fear France, who's in fact spearheading this session. Like me, she's a proud UE alumnus and she's also a graduate of Columbia University. We also have Dr. Justin Poo, who's a PhD graduate from King's College, University of London, as well as Dr. Emma Perot, who is also a PhD graduate from King's, two of our youngest and most dynamic colleagues. We are also very um, privileged to have with us one of our junk lecturers, that in itself is exciting, because apart from our, our permanent staff, we have a number of distinguished persons who are practitioners outside of the faculty who join us for particular courses. So we have um, Jeanette Deet, who is a very experienced legislative drafting adjunct lecturer working with us on the LLM program. Our faculty of law has been in existence for over 70 years. We are one of the branches of this faculty. It's, of course, a regional university, as many of you know. So we have sisters in, at KV Barbados and Mona, Jamaica. And we have a proud tradition of scholarship, legal education, and more recently, especially here in Trinidad and Tobago, activism. And of course, we have a sterling staff, well-qualified, committed, and motivated to fuel the faculty. Just to let you in a little boost, in all of the surveys that the university has done, the faculty of, faculty of Law St. Augustine has scored very highly, in fact, often number one in student satisfaction 
and relevance of our programs. So at St. Augustine, we are very, very proud of how we have continued the UE legal tradition, but more so, I think we believe that we have enhanced it. And I say that because we have, at the St. Augustine faculty, we have completed a number of cutting edge innovative in initiatives. So in the curriculum, for example, we initiated oil and gas uh, programs as well as banking law, entertainment law, sports law, to add to the quite comprehensive, perhaps more traditional LLB curriculum that of course we offer, uh, as would any law school or any decent law school would it solve, the normal ones that you probably see on television, the criminal law, the contract law, and so on. Those are part of the traditional curriculum. And of course, we offer the LLM programs and the PhD programs. Uh, entry into law is still quite competitive, although we are finding ways to open it up and to make it, you know, to have a more diverse student body, um, not just the person who gets his straight A's on the Cape and so, although we, of course, welcome that. But we really believe in the UE's AAA strategic plan. And the core of that is agility, access, and alignment. And we've been very involved in several exciting and forward-looking activities which promote this strategy. So, for example, we have at the faculty bid for and won several competitive donor-funded projects. So from the European Union, human rights projects, for example, done very important work on refugees and on migrants, we led the way in the advocacy in these areas, indigenous peoples, disability issues through our newly established International Human Rights Clinic. Uh, currently, we are working on remand injustice. We have represented at international fora, so for example, at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights in Washington, speaking about these issues. Probably seeing a pattern here. So activism is a, is a pillar of the strategic plan of the university. And as you heard from my colleague in marketing, Mr. Uh, uh, Director Dorio, yes, uh, we certainly do intend to build lawyers who are interested in social change and who understand and can help develop the society. That's part of our plan for you when you do law. So the issues of justice and inequality are very important to us and bridging the gaps to give the underserved opportunities in law and legal education also important. So for example, we started a new scholarship based on activism, um, the McCandle Daga Scholarship, current holders, Karim and Marcel, some of you may have seen him on television recently. And that is a way of broadening access, as well as ensuring that we create new lawyers with the tools to meaningfully um, bring about to promote social change. So it's not just about the fuddy daddy law bits. I always tell my students, yes, come and do the sort of more traditional ones, go out there and make lots of money but we want to do more than that. We want the law to be part of our societies in a, in a very meaningful way, part of change in the society. Uh, we've also had quite a, a lot of success in international moves. Uh, we have um, Dr. Poro with us, I'm sure she mentioned that today because she's currently leading um, the, the moves, the Jessup mood, the Inter-American mood. What is a mood? Something like a mock trial, I guess you would say. And of course, several exciting conferences, workshops, banking, commercial law, sports, oil and gas. There's so much happening in the faculty of law. I think there's something for everyone. And I want to also mention that we have a thriving, very dynamic law, law student society. Um, and you will be part of that institution if you do join us. Join us. There's one little important a uh, fact that I want to mention in this little introduction, and that is that there's an added bonus to doing law at the University of the West Indies, and that is because we are the only institution with direct access to the three law schools in the current. You may or may not know as yet that in order to practice as an attorney, this part of it, the academic part, what we call the LLB program, is just the first step. After that, you have to do the bar or get your certificate 
legal, your legal education certificates, you have to do another two years at law school. And if you're a graduate of the University of the West Indies, you are guaranteed access, at least for now, because there are many who are trying to challenge that to the court. So if you study elsewhere, you would not uh, be guaranteed that access. You would have to do an exam, and there's no guarantee you would enter. And of course, you cannot practice again without this, what we call LEC qualification. So there's a holistic package um, for you to consider. I'm sure you have lots of questions. I just wanted to give you a bird's eye view. Uh, we think that we have, um, we have done quite a bit in terms of ensuring that our students have a really well-rounded and excellent legal education. We can send them there out with the best of them. Many of our students do in fact go on abroad afterwards to their graduate studies and top their classes and do very well out there, which is testimony to us that we're doing something right. So I'll stop there for the time being because I'm part of the panel and I'll be there to answer your questions as well, as well as to wrap up. So let me hand over back to our master ceremony. Thank you, Professor Antoine. Thank you for that. And as you heard from Law's very passionate Dean, you have lecturers of great caliber. You'll also be joining a family atmosphere and their endless and exciting possibilities. So before I introduce you to our next speaker, I want to, to give a hail out as I promised. I see we have persons from Dominica, Tortola, Jamaica, Barbados, Grenada, St. Kitts, Guyana, Tobago, and of course, Trinidad. Welcome, a warm, warm welcome to all of you. And I know you will be enlightened from what you hear for the next hour and a bit. So now I'm happy to introduce you to Mrs. France, the faculty's deputy dean, and she will be on hand to tell you more about the field of law and the many opportunities for those who enroll with the faculty. And she will elaborate a bit more about the different avenues you can pursue. So, Mrs. Franz, I hand the mic over to you. I'm not sure if you unmuted your mic, so. Good evening, everyone. It is my job today to tell you all a little bit about our faculty and to suggest possible careers that will be available to you should you decide to join us and to just share some highlights about our faculty. So I prepared a small PowerPoint presentation to guide the talk. So I know there are lots of questions that you probably have. For many of our students who are still in secondary school and parents who might be viewing, you should, might be wondering, what type of subjects should you study at secondary school? Well, there are lots of rumors about certain subjects to be accepted or not, but I'm here to tell you today that any subjects would work. Um, once you have your compulsory maths and English, you can do any complement of subjects at CXC or at A levels. You just need to have your minimum five CSEC or O-level passes, and three two-unit CAPE or A-level passes. Of course, that's just minimum, and law is a very competitive faculty to enter. So while that's the minimum um, level of grades that you need to have, you need to know that only the very best persons, the very best grades will be accepted. So you will have to do very well. But what about the more mature students, people who have first degrees already? Well, if you have a first degree, then generally you need to have uh, a degree from an accredited tertiary level institution, whether it's an associate degree, a certificate or a diploma, and there must be a minimum GPA of 3.5 and above, right? If you have a first class degree, the good news is that you would be able to do the program in two years instead of the traditional three years for the LLB bachelor degrees. And we also cater for persons who are mature, and also who have served in law enforcement, this is just a very, very small number of people because spaces are very limited. But we are mindful of, of the fact that some people have a lot to give and they might not have the traditional transcript record, but they certainly can thrive and do very well in our faculty. And so for a very small handful 
who prove themselves worthy, they can enter with a previous degree and or with significant work experience or evidence of professional development. So these, this handful of people would have to apply in addition to the usual application form, they would have to submit a written, a written request for them to enter on, on this um, level and also to submit a, a CV detailing their professional work experience. Of course, these spaces are very limited, but they do exist. These people will also have to be interviewed by the faculty dean and the admissions committee. So how long does it take to become an attorney at law? The dean just spoke about the fact that to be able to practice, you have to attain an LEC, a legal education certificate from a law school. So the LLB degree takes three years. If you happen to be a direct entrant, a person who has a first class degree first, then it could take you two years, but most people, the LLB degree will take them three years. Then they will have to do two years at a law school, whether it be the law school in Trinidad, which is the Hewitt and Law School, or they go to another law school like um, the law school in Mona. Right? So it will take five years in total to become an attorney at law. And I'm sure some of you want to know whether all attorneys are the ones like we see on TV who represent criminals. Well, I think that most of you might know that the obvious answer is no. So yes, there are lots of criminal law attorneys and that's a very important service that they give to society, but there are many other areas of law that our students are exposed to. So there's several types of law and um, our lecturers, um, Dr. Perro will, and our other lecturers who are on the panel, they will introduce you to other types of law offered in our LLB degree laws like public international law, really exciting things like Caribbean human rights law and intellectual property law and constitutional law. So there are various areas of law. Criminal law is just the tip of the iceberg. And if you were to enter into the faculty, you get to see so many other types of law, which as the Dean says, touches on all aspects of human life, right? And so it follows then that if you do become an attorney at law, you don't have to be a courtroom lawyer. I mean, yes, many lawyers become courtroom lawyers, and we all know them from the news and the media, but the truth is that very, very many other lawyers are not known via the media, but they make substantial contributions, and they go into various fields like accounting, commerce, banking, the diplomatic corps, working with international human rights bodies, whether they take the role of activist or they work in think tanks, um, coming up with the ideas and concepts for changing structural inequalities in society and ideas for how things should be done in new ways. They could even become NGOs. They could even become entrepreneurs or work for NGOs. So there's a vast area available beyond merely what we know about criminal practice or negligence claims and these different things. There are very many things that you can do if you become an attorney at law. So at this point, I would just like to take a little time to talk about possible careers. So this PowerPoint is useful. This slide is useful because it, it lists a whole set of possible careers. So some stand out a lot, like you could become a politician, a judge, a researcher, a human rights activist. So I'll just talk a little bit in the next few slides about some areas that you might be interested in and also to show how the faculty has done work in these areas, okay? So suppose you are passionate about human rights issues, right? I mean, that is definitely an up and coming area. We are so much more aware now about oppression and injustice. I mean, it's very apparent, both internationally and in our nation. So if you have a heart for justice and you hate to see unfair situations, perhaps you have a calling in human rights and then you could become a human rights activist, not just an activist who cares deeply about issues, but you could be armed with the law, knowledge of the law. And some interesting areas are areas like child rights, you know, vulnerable people who need the voice of others to advocate for their interests or disability rights. Or you can become a human rights attorney at law. We have a, a relatively new court called the Equal Opportunities Tribunal, where persons can bring claims where they, are, where they claim that they have been discriminated against. So you can represent persons 
to try to effect justice in your, in your sphere. You could also work for international or regional human rights bodies. I mean, everybody should know about the United Nations. So these human rights bodies that um, try to lead the way in helping nations and states to, 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 to try to make things fairer within their jurisdictions. You could perhaps attain to work for one of these bodies, or you could even work for a think tank or an NGO, a think tank. Is, a, is an entity that comes up with ideas and tries to address issues of injustice in societies. So you could be aligned to a think tank and just write and think and ponder on issues or an NGO actively lending to a cause. So this is a very, very good area if you have this sort of interest. And our faculty is very interested in human rights. Um, we have had human rights open days. We have had certain grants where we've had to put on several events to educate the public on human rights stuff. And it's not just the faculty that does these things, but students take part. So our law students have participated in planning human rights open days with several components like entertainment and even education. So our students really enjoy these things where we use drama, music, and a whole sorts of avenues to highlight human rights issues to um, educate the public, right? Um, our law students have done amazing things like visit Riman Yard um, and our human rights clinic. They have done presentations before the Inter-American Court on New Committee on Human Rights. And they have even assisted in client representation. And you can do this too if you become a member of the law faculty. And suppose you like sports. Well, Sports in the law is an exciting area that you can work with. I mean, there's several international sporting bodies. If you like sports, I know that you know about them. So there's FIFA and WICB. So you could, work, you could give advices or represent if you are that good um, or work for these bodies. Or you could even represent athletes. I mean, recently we've had certain claims made by our local athletes and we'd have had to have attorneys who were versed in that area of law represent them or even relevant government bodies. So for instance, there's a Minister of Sport. Like that ministry would need an attorney who has specific um, training or expertise in that area. So that's a, a space for you where you could combine your natural interest with the law. So our students have participated and attended our sports law conference in 2018, where we discussed various issues related to sports. And that was very interesting. And what about the entertainment industry? Right. Well, if you are interested in law as it merges with the entertainment industry, there's an area of law called intellectual property that the word property sort of gives a hint as to what it's about. It's about the property in compositions. Right. And if you think about compositions, you can think about entertainers, people who write songs, people who write the tune or the music for songs. What about authors, composers, you know, um, or even manufacturers? So persons who deal with intellectual property, they deal with the property behind that sort of thing. And they try to um, protect it, protect it from being used by others. So you would learn all about that type of law, copyrights, trademarks, and you'll be able to implement those concepts in the area of your interest, right? So that's just a few areas that relate to um, entertainment and, and intellectual property. And you know, a very interesting area as we are so much aware of oppression on rights, you know that intellectual property even touches on stuff like environmental rights of indigenous peoples. So it's very interesting how law is so vast and so broad, it could touch on so many things and you could find an interest there. And everybody always speaks about commercial law, right? I mean, what about commercial law, right? If you are interested in that sort of area, then you could become a company lawyer a lawyer who is employed by a company and would advise the company as legal issues would arise, or a corporate se secretary. A corporate secretary sits on the board of a company and advises the directors on issues related to the company. You could be an oil and gas specialist, where we know that we have principally an oil and gas economy. So there's a lot of scope for you to develop your expertise and to provide legal advice in that area. Or you could be a specialist at drafting contracts, in which case if people want to engage in their business. So a contract is a sort of an arrangement between parties where they enter into business, right? And there's several types of contracts, right? 
but that contract will dictate the arrangement. And so you could have the skills to draft contracts to, to allow entities like companies and people to work together. Or you could do the traditional thing like become an associate and eventually a partner at perhaps a commercial law firm. And we have several commercial law firms in Trinidad and Tobago and in the region and of course internationally. And so we, our students have participated in several corporate related conferences. So you've seen some, some, some um, large titles coming up here, like we had banking law workshops, we had oil and gas conferences, et cetera, et cetera. So it, company law in that area, commerce and corporate governance is a very vast area that you could also um, get into if that's your area of interest. And you know, a law degree can also equip you for a career related to parliament, right? So we have also had our, our interaction with Parliament. Um, one of our panelists is Mrs. Janetta G to draft laws, right? If you are interested in governance and laws, you can become involved in drafting laws. And that's a very specialized skill. And it's a very useful skill, especially where we are coming at a, to a point in our nation's history where we have to start to think about how we want to be governed and what we think should be. I'm sure you have heard about stuff like constitutional reform, and I'm sure that there are new interesting topics like terrorism and these different things. All these different things, they need law to back it up. So as an attorney, you could play that role in drafting laws, right? And many of our, if you're interested in politics, many of our political contributors are attorneys, right? So ministers in government, I'm sure that if I could take some answers, some of you could say, well, I know that our current attorney general is a lawyer, right? Our minister of national security is a lawyer. Former attorney generals have been lawyers. Our current leader of opposition and our former prime minister, she is a lawyer. So, I mean, certainly politics is an area that's open to you. Of course, you don't have to do law to become a politician, but it just so happens that many of our politicians happen to be lawyers, right? And then just think about the various issues of life. Like think about your life. I'm sure that you all are very versed with Facebook and Instagram and these other types of media. So what about defamation claims and people make statements about others? You could do representation in that area or family law matters, husband, wife, children issues, medical lawsuits. Think about stuff like the interpretation of the constitution, contract and land matters, um, claims if someone suffers an accident, um, compensation for accidents or wills and probate that's to do with um, how you want your assets to be distributed after your death or can you go into that role of not preparing persons wills for them and advising them after death advising beneficiaries of estates on how things must be distributed right environmental law matters so these most of the matters here are, are matters related to people and companies, but also they're matters that touch on life, like environmental law. Do you care about the environment? Well, those are also things that you will have access to if you do law, right? So obviously it's very academic, but you know what? In the law faculty, we connect learning with life, right? So we believe in work-life balance. So we have lots of other activities in addition to the academic work, right? Um, the Dean spoke about mooting. We have a vibrant mooting, um, mooting team. Um, one of our lecturers who's speaking today, Dr. Emma Perot, she was in charge of mooting last academic year. And we have done very, very well. If you think about it, Trinidad is a very small country, but we have gone into these international con competitions and have excelled. And that says a lot about our caliber of students and the caliber of lecturers that we have. So we have... Um, lots of spoils that we have, have had from these international competitions like um, international, um, the international mooting competitions. And in addition to that, um, we with students have made presentations before the Inter-American Court on various human rights issues. So you could take part in these things even while being a student. You don't even have to graduate to do, the, to do this. And of course, we have our very vibrant law society and at the law faculty, we take our students very, very seriously. Our students have a voice and our law society president, they sit on meetings and 
the needs and the concerns of our students are very heavily voiced and they're taken into account and we interact well with our students and we try to mentor our students to become the best that they can be. And here, I have, here we have two pictures of past sports days. So students, they have their sports days and lecturers come and participate and lots of initiatives and camaraderie. So it's a very vibrant society, right? And you could be a part. So I hope that I was able to demonstrate for you tonight that law touches all of life. And if you do law, you are sure to find an area that interests you. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Dean. After that presentation, explaining the vibrancy of the faculty and the breadth of options, I hope our viewers have a better insight of where law can take, take you next. And uh, what I want you to hear now is how, the how about it. And um, a reminder that we will be answering your questions after all the presentations in the Q&A segment, but feel free to continue sharing your questions in the chat. I see the Dean and some of uh, the lecturers are answering the questions in the chat and I want to, to urge you to continue asking. And up next, we will have Dr. Justin Koo and Dr. Emma Perot, both lecturers in the faculty. They will give you the specifics on the Bachelors of Law and the Masters of Law uh, that are offered at the faculty. So I now turn it over to my two colleagues. Thanks for now. Uh, evening, everyone. Uh, so my name is Justin Koo, and I'm a lecturer at the Faculty of Law, and I'm here to talk to you today a little bit about what will actually happen if you do get into the program. So just to take you through the day-to-day -day runnings of it and to expose you to what, it will, what life will be like as a law student. So we just have a little breakdown here of what we'll cover in this presentation with my colleague, Dr. Emma Perot, and I will talk to you a little bit about what is law really about, um, what to expect while being at uh, the UE to do law, the LLB, and preparing for legal studies. So what you can do in the meantime before you actually get into the program. And then I'll hand you over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Perot, who will take you through the actual LLB and some of the topics that will be covered, et cetera. So one of the biggest questions I often get from students who are thinking about doing law is, well, why should I do law? And I want to share a little bit of a personal story with you before getting into it. When I start, when I applied to do law, I didn't really know what I wanted to do going forward. I just thought, hey, well, you know, the law is cool. It sounds interesting. Um, you get a good job from it subsequently. And what, all of those things are true. But also, having done all of these degrees in law, I realized that law is something that is everywhere. And it's applicable to any and everything that you will do in your life going forward. So it helps us develop a better understanding of the world because every topic you can think about has a legal element to it. And if we're talking about politics, we're talking philosophy, history, economics, uh, psychology, sociology, etc. there's some element of the law that comes in there. So even though you're going to study law and you will be learning substantively what the law is, you will also have to understand that the law doesn't operate in a vacuum. Uh, law works in conjunction with everything else that goes on in society. Laws are influenced by all the other factors that are out there. So in particular, laws might be passed because of, you know, the economic situation. So with COVID happening, a lot of things that are extraneous to law uh, will become part of the law going forward. So laws will be passed to deal with uh, healthcare aspects. So that involves health, which typically has nothing to do with what a regular ordinary day-to-day -day lawyer does, but there's a specialty in health law now uh, to deal with things that may be pandemic related, for example, uh, where people have financial difficulties, laws may be passed to help individuals who are in need, for example. Um, laws are also political in nature, having to go through the parliamentary process, etc. So studying law necessarily means studying other subjects built into the system. More importantly, though, I think law is such a nice area to study is so interesting because of transferable skills. So even if you choose to study law and don't want to become a lawyer, i never did the bar. So I did the LLB, did an LLM, and then went straight into a PhD. I never practiced law um, and I had no interest in practicing law from the second year of my LLB. 
So I'm a little bit of a, hy uh, of a hybrid because I didn't do the bar and most lawyers would do the LLB and then go to you wedding law school or do the bar certificate elsewhere and then get into legal practice. But I took a different route. So I am evidence that you can do something else with your law degree. So in terms of developing transferable skills, a lot of things that are very prominent in law would involve analysis. So you have to solve problems, you have to engage with legal reasoning, but it also involves a significant level of communication. You have to be able to talk to people, you have to be able to write and articulate your thoughts very clearly to get your points across. Um, law is not an easy area to do because it's very time consuming, so time management skills become very important. You always have to be attentive to detail. The details and nitty gritty really matter in law. Um, mistakes will be made, yes, but that's why you have to go through the LLB and you have to go through the LEC at you wedding so that you could learn about making these mistakes in a safe environment. Um, critical thinking is the key. You always have to think outside the box in applying legal rules. It's not just good enough to know what the law is and stick it straight into any sort of scenario. You have to be able to understand what the law is but at the same time, be able to apply that law to new circumstances, to new scenarios that may not have been thought about before. Sort of the proverbial exploiting loopholes. Um, that's, that's some of the things that we do as lawyers in critical thinking. Uh, so why study law? Well, if you want to really test yourself and push your mental boundaries, law might be the subject for you. And as I said, I didn't know why I wanted to do law, but the minute I started my LLB, I fell in love with the law and, and I've dedicated my life to the law as such. So it's really an interesting area. And anyone who is willing to test themselves, I would say, you know, do a law degree to really try and better yourself and also better your society because the legal knowledge that you will gain will make a huge difference. So what to expect if you get through to the LLB program? Uh, what's the life of a law student like? Well, First things first, expect a lot of reading. Um, I am not a lecturer that pulls punches. I tell people as it is, law is a lot of reading. It is a lot of work. If you know that you don't like reading, um, you might want to reassess either the amount of reading that you do or perhaps consider something else. So while my colleague, uh, Mrs. France and the Dean give you all the nice ideas about law, I don't want to mislead you into thinking that law is an easy degree. Law is hard but it's also very rewarding. So some of the other skills that you need to develop beyond very uh, comprehensive reading skills is also a high proficiency in writing. Law necessarily requires us to be very clear, to be very concise and to be very precise. So what that means is that our writing and our conversational skills must also reflect that. We have to be able to articulate ourselves clearly. We have to be able to communicate very clearly. As I mentioned previously, uh, critical thinking is also an important part. You need to be able to think differently, think outside the box, because sometimes difficult legal problems require new solutions. It's not just about applying old law or past laws or uh, laws to previous circumstances we know about. To be a good lawyer, you have to be able to think outside that box and be able to deal with new situations. That's the difference in winning a hard case and you know, making new laws. For example, when you go up to the Supreme Court, whether it be the CCJ, or the Privy Council, uh, for example, you have to be able to think outside the box because that's where the new laws are being made. Yeah. So away from sort of the requirements in terms of uh, what you need to be doing, what will you have to do? Uh, so the law program is based on coursework and exams. Uh, most of our courses were updated this year, so there's no longer 100% exams for most subjects. So you would have to do an element of coursework, which could include multiple choice questions. It could include uh, class participation, it could be an essay, it could be a research essay, etc. And there will also be exams at the end. One thing I want to say uh, honestly to everyone is law is not something that you should join because you're forced to. Similarly, law should not be something you join just to make money. You have to really love the law to do well in the law because it does require a lot of dedication. It requires a lot of commitment in particular in relation to your time and you have to be passionate about it. If you lack any of those elements, you may regret doing an LLB because of one, it's difficulty, but also the, the toll it takes on, on a person over time. So I don't want to mislead anyone at all, and I want to make it clear that it is a very difficult degree, but as I said, and as you've heard from colleagues before, it's very rewarding. And there is something in the law for everyone. 
So just understand that it requires a lot of dedication and time commitment. Um, while I'm not saying that you can just study alone, you, know, you still have to continue to do all the things that you do in your regular life, exercise, you know, play sports, go out and have fun with your friends, etc. It will require a lot on you. You will have to make sacrifices. So I'm, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news in that end if you think you can just party and do a law degree. Um, that would be a, a re really big uh, reality check when you do start the LLB program. So it's about time management, it's about balancing your life and being serious about the law as well. So just some things that uh, prospective students also ask as well, I'm considering doing law. I don't really know anything about it. What should I do now? Um, I'm still in high school or I'm doing a certificate or a diploma, associate degree, et cetera. Uh, what else can I do? So some of the things that I generally recommend to students is read as widely as possible and read fiction and nonfiction, read the newspapers, stay up to date with what's going on in world news. Uh, you have lots of free services available online, BBC News, Al Jazeera News, etc. Read as widely as possible because reading does help your writing. It does help educate um, or widen your experiences. Um, and in terms of fiction, you can feel free to read fiction as well. Any reading is good reading. So one book I recommend is The Secret Barrister. Um, it gives an insight into the life of a criminal barrister who is in the UK uh, court system. And it also exposes some of the flaws in the legal system. So for those of you who may be thinking about a career in criminal law or thinking about human rights law, et cetera, that's probably a good book to read as well because it exposes you to the idea that the law isn't perfect. A lot of times people think the law is perfect, but in reality, it's very far from perfect. So as lawyers, we're constantly learning. And as a good lawyer, you want to try and help develop the system further, help people, et cetera. Practice your writing as well. Uh, you can never get enough practice writing. Uh, being a lawyer requires you to write a lot. Uh, being a law student more so requires you to write a lot. You need to practice. And it works in tangent with, write, with reading. So the more you read, chances are the better your writing will become. Um, you don't need to necessarily be using old words, you know, all those old Latin phrases, etc. You know, that's kind of back in the day sort of things. But uh, being able to write very clearly, very concisely does help. So if you are thinking about doing law, I would recommend getting some books about uh, learning about the art of legal writing from early on, uh, or just generally, if you know you have issues with writing, practice it. Um, and it also comes in very handy for those of you who have writing courses at high school or in your certificate, etc. Most importantly, come with an open mind. Uh, so again, another personal story I'll share with you. When I started my LLB and I was still thinking about the idea of, you know, maybe I'll become a practicing lawyer. I thought, oh, you know what? Actually, I want to become an international lawyer because, you know, the idea of learning laws or about different countries seems very interesting. Well, boy, was I wrong. When I got to law school, I realized this is actually not the thing for me. And what I actually ended up doing was intellectual property law, which is something I discovered through my LLB. And then I went on to do an LLM in IP as well as I did my PhD in copyright law, which is a subset of intellectual property. So come with an open mind. Don't be set in any particular ways. Chances are your mind will change as you grow and mature because that's what the law degree does to you. It grows you, it matures you, it opens you to new experiences. So you need to be open in mind to experience that, those aspects of law school. And as my Why colleagues said earlier, there's no particular school subjects required. Um, so anything goes once you have your maths and English at the CSEC level. So at this point, I'll hand you over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Perot, who will take you through a little bit more detail about the courses that we offer on the LLB and some more insight into what, being, into what a law student is like. Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Emma Perot. I will be talking about the courses on the LLB this evening. So as Dr. Ku talked about why he got into law, rather he wasn't sure why he wanted to law, he just ended up choosing it. I was different in that when we had to choose subjects in form three, I knew I liked history, literature, geography, those kind of subjects which tend to be reading heavy. And to me, the natural choice seemed to be law because it was what I had been exposed to in terms of people talking in high school, uh, hearing friends and family talk, and law just seemed to be a good choice. I can't say I knew that much about it, more than what I saw on the television programs we're all familiar with. 
as I progressed through high school, I said, okay, I would like to go into politics. So law is also a good choice for this. Now I start my LB, which I did in England. And I realized that I truly had no idea what I was getting myself into when I started law. Even though I did some basic research, I think until you start, it's very difficult to understand what's expected of you. It is a very intense degree program, a very satisfying one, but also a very grueling one in that it really does take a lot out of you and it is something that you have to commit to, uh, to and consider it as a lifestyle in terms of how you are studying. Yes, of course, university is an exciting time for everybody. We want you to have fun, you meet new people, you really expand your view on the world and whatnot, develop new thoughts. But you need to realize that doing a law degree is something that really requires a high level of commitment in order to do well and not to get the most out of it. So throughout my LB, I went through uh, different phases of like different areas of law. And I think this is something that is beneficial in terms of the exposure we get and we give in UE with regards to the different modules. So in terms of the course that you take, the LB is a three-year program and over year one and two you're going to do compulsory courses. So you have to do the certain set courses in those first two years. Then when you get to your final year you have choices. You do 10 choices, um, choosing from the list of modules that we offer. So the compulsory courses are listed on the slides now. So these are the courses that you would do over years one and two. I am teaching law and legal systems this year and I think this is a very interesting course and one that really sets us apart from the other routes that you might take to do law in the Caribbean. So I saw somebody ask, why would you do law in you as opposed to doing law in the UK or through a UK route, for example, and having done law in the UK and now teaching at UE, I think I'm well equipped to answer this. So our LB is really designed to inform you about how the legal system operates in the Caribbean. And we do this from an historical as well as a modern context. And law and legal systems is one of the key courses in which you learn about the history of our countries and how the legal systems have been developed and shaped and how they continue to evolve. Now, I think we're all probably aware of the uh, incidents that happened recently in Trinidad with regards to the uh, killing last week. We're also aware of the Black Lives Matter movements going on in the US. Now, obviously we don't focus on the US as much, but the history of colonization has really shaped how we function as a society. And the laws obviously stem back all the way from the colonial times and have been evolving since. And I think it's very important to understand how our society has been shaped through our history, because it's something that perhaps those of you who have done Caribbean history or will be doing Caribbean history will appreciate, but it is truly something that needs to be understood in order to practice law or have a proper awareness of law within the Caribbean society, especially because we live and work in societies with different cultures, different races, different religions. We are such a melting pot and the law is the one thing that is something that we all have to adhere to despite our different beliefs and different ways of life. So doing an LB in UE really gives you this foundation and understanding of our societies the understanding of how we can improve, how we can use law to our advantage, and how we can progress our society moving forward. So I think throughout all of our courses, yes, we do look at, for example, UK and American law in reference to cases and comparison and whatnot, but we really do ground it on the relevance to the Caribbean and Caribbean societies. In terms of your choice courses, I like to think of there being three basic categories of people who want to do law or rather who have different ways of liking the law. So the first category I would describe as the everyday lawyers. So these people tend to help people on a daily basis. You have people doing, for example, family law, employment law, land law, which would have been one of the compulsory courses. So those are the everyday kind of practices that you are probably familiar with. Those areas of law are also the areas that people, mainly your friends and family members, will tend to ask you for advice on once you step in the door through UE. 
because these are very popular areas of all areas that come up uh, very commonly in everyday life. Then we have the Save the World lawyers. So these people tend to really want to make a difference to, as to how we live and make things better for everybody. So we have international human rights law, we have environmental law, we have uh, um, the International Human Rights Clinic, which is very practical and hands-on. So all these things really go towards helping people, uh, gender and law, seeing different perspectives, different views on the world, and how the law has been used as a tool of oppression at times, but how we can also change the law or manipulate the law for progression as a society. The third category I would describe is the commercial-minded people. So I fall into this category because I am a fan of intellectual property law. It is what I specialize in. So alongside intellectual property law, you'd have a corporate management, corporate insolvency, company, banking, revenue. So all those areas that really relate to industry. And I wouldn't go fast to say it's, but it's money making because uh, yes, you can make a good career out of it, but I don't think that's why you should choose law because there's so much more to it than that and you are not necessarily gonna fulfill those millionaire dreams by choosing this path. But those areas tend to be of interest to those who are more commercially minded. So we do offer a wide selection of choices in terms of the LLB and we are trying to expand. So this year we introduced entertainment law which I co-lecture on with Dr. Ku. Entertainment law was a really fun course and one that went well considering it was the first time we taught it. I think it was quite well received. It was very hands-on. We had students do a case study. So to do this, well unfortunately we had to do it over Zoom because of COVID, but to do this we had the directors behind Island Crashers, the event that usually takes place in Tobago, talk to the students. The students had to do an interview and then they had to do a case study on how Island Crashers could improve their structure. What are their risks that they are facing currently? How can they improve? How can they expand their business? So there's definitely something for everybody and you're not actually going to love every subject you do but you do tend to find your niche by the end of the LLB and say, okay, I like a certain area of law, or maybe you're really somebody who just has a great general love for law, in which case you love everything, which is fantastic. Now, I just like to reemphasize what Dr. Ku has already said, that with all the excitement that comes with law, there is a lot of reading. So if you know in your heart you don't like reading, I really don't think this is the degree to do because it is one that you will spend most of your time reading. You will have 15 hours of class, you will go home or to your apartment wherever you are staying, and you will spend hours and hours reading the textbooks, the cases, any journal articles. Some of the cases are very long and quite difficult to understand. So that is something that needs to be considered. It is something that you need to go into with your eyes open. Something that I think it's important to be very aware of. You have to be dedicated, you have to be good at time management, and you will also have to be able to manage your stress. Obviously, you manage your stress in whatever degree you choose, but you don't want to get to the point where you become so overwhelmed that you stop enjoying your degree because the end of the day, university is going to be one of the better times in your life. You want to enjoy it and have a good time. So there is a serious task in terms of finding that balance with committing to your work, doing your best, and still living a regular, enjoyable life alongside all the dedication to the LLB. So the LLB is something that I recommend for those who are curious, those who care about the world around us, those who are engaged in current social issues, those who just want to explore um, in terms of Maybe you're not sure if law is for you, but you want to figure out um, the world around you. You want to learn more, you're very inquisitive. It is not for those who want to read a book and write back down the answers directly from the book because that's not what we're assessing. It's not a regurgitation type of subject, even though there are many things you have to remember. It's really based on analysis as opposed to memory. It's not for those who don't like reading. It's not for those who maybe want to party a bit more in university, maybe want to have the more kind of American movie experience, which is very inaccurate, especially when it comes to a law degree. 
So you really need to think, do you want to commit the next three years of your life to a very intense degree, which comes with a lot of stress, but also a lot of reward at the end of the day. So I will now hand you over to my colleague, Dr. Ku, and he is going to talk about the LLM. Thank you, Dr. Perot. So just continuing on the presentation, um, I'm going to talk about the LLM for a little bit now. Uh, so the LLM is for persons who have done a law degree, uh, for the most part, who want to progress their legal knowledge. Uh, so the LLM program typically is one year, uh, though it is possible to do it part-time and you can do it over the space of two years. Uh, for an LLM, you require six courses, or in terms of the diploma, you can do four courses. So the LLM that is offered at St. Augustine is really a good, uh, really a flexible one in the sense that we have a wide array, array of topics that are offered. So there are six, or rather five specialisms that you can get. So corporate and commercial law, intellectual property law, public law, legislative drafting, which my colleague, uh, Mrs. Jeet, can talk to more in the question and answer section, and a general LLM. So when you do an LLM, the, or rather person who wants to do an LLM, uh, they normally ask, well, what benefits am I going to get from doing the LLM? And having done one myself, I would I specialize LLM at that because my LLM is an in intellectual property. I would always say uh, the idea of doing the LLM is to develop more specialized knowledge. The LLB does cover a lot of areas of law, uh, but because the law is so complicated, so dense, so complex, you can only really scratch the surface of it in the LLB. When you get into the LLM and you start doing more specialized subjects, you get a really more in-depth look at that area of law. Uh, so whether you're doing a general LLM or you're doing a specialized LLM, you're really going to get a lot more into the law that you're looking at. Uh, it helps us to further develop our legal reasoning and our critical analysis skills because by looking at the law in more detail, the questions become harder. The questions become more uh, complex. And you really have to have that uh, sort of frame of mind to match the complexity into the topics that you're looking at. So it does help us develop as lawyers, as uh, persons who are academics, as persons who are interested in law in general. And I think most importantly, if you're in practice, having an LLM, especially one with a specialism, does help you set yourself apart from all the rest of the lawyers who may have just done the LLB and the LEC alone. So it does give you benefits in your personal development, your educational development, and more so your career development. So it does set you aside from the rest. So in terms of job, job prospects, if you do an LLM, you can possibly more than likely argue that, look, this will probably allow you to get a better job or more specialized job. And it will also greatly assist you in taking on niche areas of law. So those areas of law that aren't the mainstream areas like criminal law, contract law, et cetera. So just flipping back a bit in terms of specialisms in the LLM, um, I could talk a little bit about intellectual property because I've, I've, I've taught on it. So as you see on this slide here, it says a combination of in-person and online learning. So there's some flexibility where if a program, if a course, sorry, is not being offered at the St. Augustine campus, you can take that course to fulfill the requirements of your LLM from another campus. So you may be doing a course that's being taught at Mona or being taught at Cafil while being registered at St. Augustine. Um, for example, when I taught the intellectual property course uh, specifically focused on copyright a couple of years back, I had two students from Cable and uh, one student from Trinidad. So we had a combination of in-person teaching and online learning. So it is very flexible. It is catered to persons who are practicing attorneys. So there's the classes are in the afternoon. So it's a lot more flexible for those who have jobs already. Um, so if we have particular questions about the LLM, I think the best place to discuss that would be in the Q&A section, which uh, will follow this. Uh, but if you are really interested in furthering your legal career, I would definitely recommend an LLM to everyone because you learn so much more about law. I actually learned about my PhD topic while doing my LLM, and then I, I committed the next eight, nine years of my life to that or rather my entire educational life to that um, topic that I discovered in my LLM. So um, it can really resonate deep with you and it could be something that you know, takes you to the end of your career or you know, a long space in your career, right? So uh, I'll hand over to the master ceremonies and 
continue program. Thank you to my two colleagues for a very realistic and, and, and practical viewpoint. Uh, I also thought it was interesting that you described the different routes in, in both in, in terms of academic career or the careers that you both have and in terms of the programming of the faculty and, and specifically some of the projects that uh, the students have to do. I thought it was really interesting. So viewers, future students, the fact that you are locked on to our virtual open day is testament to your interest in a career in law. The beauty of the legal profession is that it requires you to be a constant student because law is not a dormant or static thing, but it changes in response to society so that you know you're embarking upon an exciting journey with us. Before we transition to the Q&A segment, which is next, I want to assure you that we are committed to your academic journey. And to that end, we just have a few notes to share. Firstly, we are planning for a September start but we do anticipate that teaching will be done as hybrid. It will be a mixture of in-person and online instruction. The integration of on-campus teaching and online delivery will vary from one course to the next. Uh, and those that entail physical learning or exploratory activities like lab or field work will offer a combination of online and on-campus activity. Reopening of borders. Now I know this came up quite a bit in the other open days, so I'm, I'm sure that we will get questions in, in this regard. And the campus, like the rest of the country, we continue to be guided by the local authorities on the reopening of the borders. So we're monitoring and we will, uh, we will adjust as it becomes clearer with the um, protocols. In terms of the on-campus activities, they will be conducted in keeping with the established COVID-19 protocols for public spaces. And this includes, of course, physical distancing, the wearing of masks and hand hygiene. Now, as we transition, as I said, to the, the Q&A, our moderator is placing contact information in the chats very soon, if they haven't started already, on our halls of residence, our financial services, etc. And uh, to start us off with some of the answering of the questions, I, I want to call on my colleague, Mr. Nigel Bradshaw. He's our student recruitment officer with our undergraduate admissions team. And I want us to take this opportunity engage, to engage him on some of the questions we've been seeing. So Nigel, can you open your mic and share with us some key tips on submitting the application? Angela, are you with us? Yeah, yes, Hi. Hi, everyone. Good night. You hearing me well? Yes, you're okay. on. All right. Good night, everyone. Thanking all 163 persons that have come on this evening, a Friday evening in Trinidad and Tobago. And people are very, very interested to hear what we have to say about our faculty of law. I am here today to, um, to share information with you primarily about our application process for the few persons that have not yet applied for our um, faculty of law or any other faculty that you still want to apply for, you can do so because our application, undergraduate application, we will run them until 4 p.m. next Friday, July 10th, 2020. Again, the applications were for undergraduate studies to the LLB degree and other undergraduate degree programs, you will be allowed to apply. And I will now go through the nine steps of the application process with you. And at the end, I will be, I will be here to be able to give support to all the questions that are being asked primarily about the application process and whatever else I can lend support to. So I've shared my screen already and you can see that we have the application schematic broken up into different steps. First step, now our application is currently entirely online. There's no reason for anyone to visit the University of West Indies for any reason with respect to the application process. Step one, you go to our UWI website listed there. You'd see the um, forward slash admissions webpage, you go in and you make an undergraduate um, request or a postgraduate request. But I'm primarily dealing as the undergraduate student recruitment officer, I'm going to be dealing with the undergraduate um, process. Step two, 
we always make the emphasis on the fact that if it is you create a PIN, a PIN, analog and ID, the arrangement must be that you try to make one that will be fairly simple for you to remember. We do not, we don't dictate to you what to, how to be able to, um, what numerology you use or whatever, but make one that is fairly easy for you to remember so you won't be locked out of your account. Lock, being locked out of your account and not knowing what's happening with the application is possibly traumatic. Step three, select the application type. Now, in particular for the LLB program, the LLB is a full-time program. So you're going to have to select undergraduate and full-time. Once you select undergraduate and full-time, you move to step four. All your demographic details are entered, name, surname, email address, um, physical address, uh, contacts of importance, uh, if guardian, parents, uh, whatever. And thereafter, yeah, academic information is very important at that point. We need to get your academic information for secondary school leaving, and then any post-secondary education that you, have, um, that you are currently involved in or co and completing, that is the information that we want to see. And remember how I said it? That you're currently involved in and completing. We'll discuss that a little bit later. Step five, you are allowed to choose up to four programs for undergraduate study. You, at the Faculty of Law, everyone, every one of the panelists here will be able to reiterate what I'm going to say now. When choosing your four programs, not just because tonight we're dealing with the Faculty of Law, but the Faculty of Law requires that you enter the LLB at position number one out of the four programs that you would choose, if you're choosing more than one program. Okay, let me say it again. Make sure if you're choosing more than one program, the LLB is at the first choice. If it's not at the first choice, you know, it will not be considered for admission. Now, through step, from step one through to step five, you're allowed to close the application and return to it, make changes as you see fit, etc. Once it is reached step six, step six allows you to submit your application. Once you hit the submit button, this means that you're very content with all the information that you've entered, it's truthful and correct, and you hit submit, you no longer can change it. Everything in your application is complete at that time. But you certainly have to go through the next three steps. Step seven, there's a, docu a document will be provided for you that lists a number of different characteristics about your application, including how to track your application, how to do a number of things. One of the things that I allow you to do is to access the download portion for your confirmation receipt. A confirmation receipt confirms what you have applied for it confirms that you are seeking the university's uh, analysis of your application for, for the sake of admission to the university for whatever programs that you would like to be um, considered for, that you've entered. At that point, the, the, that document must be downloaded, printed, and completed. Once it's complete, it's going to have your signature and the, the date in which you completed it, right? That makes it basically a legal document. You must keep it for the rest of the application. We have now waived step eight. Step eight was where you pay the application processing fee. So for the persons residing outside of Trinidad and Tobago and for all of you residing in Trinidad and Tobago who have not yet made an application, from May 29th, the application processing fee was waived. Step nine, you, I remember I said that you, are, you don't have to do the application, you don't have to visit the, the admissions for any reason at all during our present circumstances associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Local students that are applying, foreign students applying, you can email your supporting documents to us. We allow you now to be able to scan, upload, and email your supporting documents. I want to, do you see the email addresses that you can send it to? You choose one out of the two to send it to. 
the choice is yours in terms of which undergraduate application, applicant email that you send it to. However, many persons that have been applying thus far and utilizing the upload have not scanned certified or notarized documents to, for us. The notarized documents, documents under, that should be notarized or certified are these documents. Your birth certificate, your CSEC or BGCSC or GCSC certificate, whatever you verifies the, the completion of your general secondary education, that document must be copied and certified. Thereafter, whatever post-secondary education you have completed, that document must also be certified. Now, if that document for your post-secondary education is a transcript, that transcript should be directly sent to student affairs admissions at the University of West Indies from the institution that provided you, the, um, awarded you the transcript, right? We would prefer that it comes that way from the institution that awarded you the transcript directly to student affairs admissions. Last but not least, step 10, which really and truly is step nine now. You can, you're allowed to track your application online. We note that many people in the chat have already tracked their applications wanting to know what TBA means, what incomplete outstanding items means, et cetera, right? You're allowed to track your application online and we hope that many persons will track the application once only today. There's no need to track it multiple times because we, the, uh, if you do it once a day at a specific time, you will notice what, the, within the next 24 hours when you do check again, if there is a change, there will possibly not be a change for some time. All right, please bear with us as we seek to manage a process that has become a bit lengthy based on certain challenges that we've had during the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown and everything else associated with it. But we feel strongly in student affairs admissions and across the rest of the university that we'll be able to manage these challenges and ensure that we're able to have an enrollment class in the LLB program and a number of other undergraduate programs at the University of West Indies at St. Augustine campus later this year, when we start hopefully at the end of September. Thank you very much. I am certain that my colleagues from marketing have entered my email address into the chat. Feel free to, to send me your emails 24-7, 351 days of the year, 14 public holidays in Trinidad and Tobago when you should not send an email to me. All right? Just saying. But Every other day, you can send me an email and re anticipate a response in 48 hours or less. I do enjoy looking, looking out for you and responding to your emails. Um, we like to give the assurance that you do care about our, our, enrollment, uh, um, our current enrollment for the university. And we do hope and wish you all the very best for those of you who are going into exams. We do hope you wish you all the very best in the current circumstances with your exam period. Thank you very much, and I'm still available to answer questions in the chat. Do take care. Thank you very much, Nigel. And I'm sure we'll be calling on you in a couple minutes or so as we make our way through the questions. But no before problem. that, I want to call on my other colleague, Ms. Kathy Ann Lewis, and she is the Student Services Manager from our Division of Student Services and Development. And the aim of the division is to contribute to your overall development and provide an excellent student life experience. So, Ms. Lewis, if you can take the floor to share a little bit more with our viewers. Thank you, Mrs. Gregorio. And good evening and welcome to all our participants on the live tonight. I don't know about you, but I am so excited based on the information that was shared by the Dean and Dr. Ku, Ms. Perot, Ms. Francis. I am excited and based on the activity in the chat, I take it that you're excited as well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for participating in the live and asking the questions. 
This shows your interest and we are excited for you to join our UESCA family. As Ms. Gregorio said, I work within the Division of Student Services and Development. And as the name implies, that's exactly what we do. We work in tandem with and in collaboration with the faculty to enhance your student experience. And this is mainly through support. We offer non-academic support to all our students. We look after the holistic development of our students on campus. So the faculty looks after the academic aspects and student services after the support aspects. Now the research shows that students that receive consistent and strategic support while on the university campus are more likely one, to have a more enhanced experience and two, to succeed at university. So I know you all were taking some notes and so was I because there was so much information going around. Um, as Dr. Ku said, it's gonna be a lot. Dr. Ms. Perot said there'll be a lot of reading. So I did a lot of writing. And so I'm just going to segue from little bits of information that they provided. One of the things that both Dr. Ku and Ms. Perot said is that you would have to have a keen sense of time management. Dr. Ku said, yes, you, you know, exercise, do the things you love, but be sure to set aside time for your academic pursuits. And Dr. Perot enhanced it by saying, for a lot of reading. Within the Division of Student Services and Development, we have a unit called the Student Life and Development Department that actually helps you to apply skills of time management. We actually facilitate workshops and sessions on study skills, on, on time management. If you're having issues with some of the classes within your classes, Student Life and Development will provide for you one-on-one -on -one tutoring, and that's free of charge students. Once you apply and you're accepted to the university, you have access to those services free of charge. There are a number of other services. I want you to be aware as well that we are an inclusive and accessible campus. Student Life and Development also provide services for students with disabilities and med medical conditions. So you have examination accommodations, classroom accommodations. If you need a note taker, if you need any assistance at all, students with disabilities and medical conditions, we provide it for you. International and regional students as well, the mature students, I saw some questions coming from mature students and their particular situations. Student Life and Development also offer, offers advice and assistance to these students. All you need to do is make an appointment. So I'm gonna give you the email address for Student Life and Development just in case you have any questions in advance. It is sldd at sta.uwi.edu. And you can send Dr. Hoggins an email and she can help you with any assistance that you need. Dr. Perot also spoke about, you know, balance and perhaps sometimes becoming overwhelmed. It's possible. Students, do not worry. If you are overwhelmed, we also have support for that within the Division of Student Services and Development. Dr. Sarah Chinyanki heads that department. It is known as Counseling and Psychological Services. So any emotional um, 
instances you have, mental conditions, anything, you feel a little stressed, stress from the classroom, from home, from just life in general, you can make an appointment at counselor at sta.uwi.edu or visit what we refer to as CAPS, the Counseling and the Psychological Services Office, and you can make an appointment to see one of our many counselors. Again, there's no charge attached to it. We offer this because our remit on the SCA campus is to support you while you're there in your academic pursuits. And in discussion, you would see as well, we offer support for you when you leave as well. As an alumni, you also have some support. And some of you will get an email very soon about some programs we have for incoming students. So stay tuned and very important, check your emails. Even when you're on campus, very important to stay engaged, check your emails. Very important. I also want to speak about Dr. Ku spoke a lot about the, the breadth and, and Ms. Francis, the breadth of opportunities available to you when you study law. And I'm really happy and excited about that. So we don't come in, um, Dr. Ku said something, I wrote it down, you know, to remove the limits. And that's what we want you to do. We want you to explore that. We want you to explore those options. We also have a division, a uh, department that helps you with that. Um, actually, my department, whoops, whoops, the Careers Co-Curricular and Community Engagement Department, we give you an opportunity to explore which area of law do I really want to get into. So we have a, a career assessment that you can take that's going to help you realize your interests and your skills and tell you exactly which area of law you can begin focusing on. It's never too early. Career advising is a process. Career planning and career advising. Ms. Francis also spoke about human rights and activism. Well, we have a community engagement department and part of our remit is to get our students involved in activism and civic engagement. And always remember students, and you'll hear it a lot once you get on campus, you'll hear a lot about DUGA. We call it DUGA, the Distinguished, distinguished UWE Graduate Attributes. We want you to be civic-minded. We want you to be engaged. IT skill, Dr. Cool spoke about problem solving and critical thinking, analyzing that global thinker that, <coughs> excuse, that is very aware of the regional context. As uh, Dr. Perot said, she could give you that insight because she studied overbroad, but the context of the Caribbean identity and what maintains in the legal fraternity in our context is very important. So when we speak about the distinctive UWE graduate and developing that individual, we help you gain access to opportunities. And you also would have heard the faculty, they also organize opportunities. So as I tell you, the faculty, student services, we work together to ensure you have that holistic, well-rounded experience on campus. The Dean, speaking of civic engagement and human rights, she spoke about the McCandle Dagger Scholarship and she referenced Kareem, who, who, who has been a recipient in the past. And I want to tell you about the scholarship and bursary section and these scholarships and bursaries are non academic related. What does that mean? It means that you do not necessarily have to use it to pay fees for classes or courses. They are not bound to academic pursuits. We have donors and these, these donors have specific criteria. Sometimes it's based on your faculty, it's based on your major, sometimes it's based 
on geographic location. Where do you live? There may be a company and the university has a lot of stakeholders, locally, regionally, internationally. So it may be based on where you live. And it's very important students to access these. And for the undergraduate bursaries, you can email ugbursaries at sca.uwi.edu. Those bursaries are still open. So they are available to you. As we always tell students, don't say no to yourselves. It's there, it's open, go ahead and apply. And the Macandal Dagger is just one scholarship that we have for law in particular, but there are a range of other scholarships that you may be eligible to. Yes, Macandal Dagger, it's just for you. So go ahead, apply, um, take advantage of what we have there. Also for mature students we have, and commuting students, we do have the students' activities facilities and commuter students um, department. What that department is geared towards, it's helping the commuter students who do not live on whole. It gives them an, them an opportunity to form a bond, to form relationships and to feel as though they belong. Research speaks about students want that sense of belonging on the campus. So the student activities, facilities, and commuter students department provides that sense of belonging. They have a number of activities and you can email sac at sta.uwi.edu to find out some more about those activities. That's for commuting students. But we also have some halls that we would want you all to come on. It's your home away from home. It's excitement, it's activities, it's hall concerts, it's debates, it's leadership. And the halls, they provide an opportunity for you to learn about different cultures. They provide that entrance as the lecturers mention for civic engagement, for you to have discussions on issues, but in a safe environment, because we support that. There are a number of activities. I spoke to Mr. Kevin Snanks. He's the manager for the um, accommodation unit. And he is saying right now they are putting things in place to go online or blended because they want you all to continue having that engaged and active experience on the halls. It's a good place to be. It's, it's exciting. Um, Mr. Snags is busy doing all that he needs to do right now to ensure that you have that well-rounded experience on the hall. In addition to the hall, because the hall provides opportunities for leadership as well, which is our distinguished UE graduates, our leaders, look around the Caribbean. I wouldn't go into that now because that list is unending. But I'm sure you'll learn about it when you get here. But there are opportunities for leadership. The Guild of Students also provides opportunities for leadership. Within the Guild of Students, you can be a leader on the Guild. You can be a faculty leader and be associated with the Guild of Students. You can be a leader on the hall and be associated with the Guild of Students. The Guild of Students, they also facilitate a number of activities to encourage you, Mrs. Amanda Best Noel, she works with the Guild of Students. She works in the administrative office and they facilitate each year, they increase their offerings of programs to encourage you to be leaders and to develop leadership abilities. Dr. Ku spoke about transferable skills. That is key. That is key to holistic development. These are the skills that you can learn in one area go to another area and use it 
and use it well and apply it. And that is one of the areas where the University of the West Indies is distinctive in the students we produce. We produce leaders and they are distinctive in their own regard. I think I have touched all except one, which is the office of the director. Very important, they provide the strategic leadership for the Division of Student Services and Development. And very important, they oversee and guide your transition into the university. So as I said, very soon, you would re begin to receive emails, excuse, you'll begin to receive emails about upcoming programs and your transition. They do orientation, they, they facilitate orientation and transition programs, including how to navigate UE web, UE's website. What study skills do I need? What other skills do I need? Where can I access A to Z? They provide that orientation and transition, which is another key, the research says, to success on campus. So students, it's eight de uh, departments within the division. I cannot give you all the information, but I've given you a little sampling. Very important, I want to tell you, remember, apply. That's the first step. Don't say no to yourself. Mr. Bradshaw said we are still accepting applications. Apply, and once you are accept, accepted, become engaged on campus, become involved on campus, and leave a legacy. And don't forget, we also have engaged alumni. As the, the dean said, a lot of our lecturers here are alumni. So thank you so much, and I am really looking forward to seeing you. Mrs. Gregorio, back to you. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, our viewers got a, a good insight in terms of our student support services. So now I will call on Mrs. France to help me with the navigating some of the, the questions. And I want to start off with the first question. And I'm um, just reading it about, uh, I think it was about careers, future employability. Given the current climate with so many innovations, how does the faculty plan to equip students with a competitive advantage in the labor market through the UE experience? So I don't know if you want to ask the Dean just to kick things off with that and I could possibly repeat it. Yes, I would invite the Dean to, to respond to that question. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I think I started off by saying that many of our programs are cutting edge. In fact, if you compare us with our sister campuses, we have had new kinds of courses. We still have the oil and gas and now we've introduced the energy component for the LLM or the common stream as well to complement oil and gas. And incidentally, yes, oil prices may have dropped, but and all the experts agree that oil and gas will be with us for a very long time. And of course, we have Guyana expanding. So we were the first ones to bring that on board. And I mentioned some of the other courses at the bank. We have the team run the sports, also financial law. We have a whole host of new courses. We are continually looking to see um, that all courses are relevant. Uh, there are so many areas in law you could never attempt to do any at all, I should say. But, um, we do a fairly good job of ensuring that we are always attempting to put on new courses and not just to put on new courses, but to ensure that our existing, what I call the more traditional courses, are relevant. I found it very interesting, Dr. Peru talking about law degree systems, which used to be my baby um, before, and she was able quite nicely to contextualize it what's happening today in the country, the Black Lives Matter, as well as um, the social unrest and the social injustices in our area. And so even the, the so-called traditional courses, if you have 
lectures like we do. And if you have students, and we have excellent students, we always have excellent um, students who can challenge lectures, they're able to, to bring that kind of, of thinking to, to even those traditional courses. There's also more leeway in terms of the postgrad. Um, we have a fairly broad postgrad offering, and the postgrad is regional in that we can we can tap into expertise not just in Trinidad and Tobago but also across the Caribbean. So there's a challenge for any law faculty, it doesn't matter where you go in the world. No law faculty will offer every single law course on this. That would be impossible. But I think it is important. One of the things that I think it's important to emphasize that law. When you study law, law is not just about the information that you gather. Law is, when you study the discipline of law, it teaches you to think in a particular way, to deconstruct and issue and define answers to that issue. That is really skill of a lawyer. So you, be, you don't have to have done internet, intellectual property, let us say, if you're a practicing lawyer. You could take on a case, do the research, and still give a good account of yourself in a court or in a brief. So really what it is the method, how you go about researching, how you go about thinking about an issue. So from that point of view, we always, I would suggest, have a competitive edge. But the short answer is that we have a fairly broad And I did mention that our students have, have given us very high marks, often number one, in terms of student satisfaction survey, and in particular, the component which is about relevance to the society. They have felt that what they learned at, at UWE, St. Augustine, in the law degree, was very relevant for them to leave here and go and start becoming a lawyer or legal um, practitioner. Thank you very much, Dean, for that very clear response. And uh, we move on to flexibility for, of classes. I understand that this program is full-time. What sort of flexibility is there for persons who are employed on a full-time basis while pursuing this degree? Persons asking what provisions are in place. I could respond to that. Um, it is a full-time, it is a full-time program. Um, so there isn't much flexibility if students are forced to work because of their personal circumstances and they would have to be able to introduce a flexibility on the side of their work. So for instance, things like time off or um, arrangements for working from home. Um, most of our classes take place during the daytime hours as um, Dr. Pooh said on, on the chat, they start at 8 a.m. and the last class ends at around six. It doesn't mean that classes run every single day for all of the hours. There might be perhaps one day where you mightn't have a class and then you might be able to arrange things around. Um, because we are a full-time program, we are not able to provide lots of um, help in terms of sometimes students might ask for job letters or various things, you know, for letters for their jobs or various things. We are a full-time program. And if a student is constrained to work and we understand that, they will have to make it work. And students have made it work. Okay. Next question. How is an LLB from UE different from an LLB from the UK? I know we touched on it a little bit earlier, but perhaps we can share it again. Some persons may yeah. have... Well, I, I would call on Dr. Peru to answer that. Hi, so an LLB is, uh, LLB in UE is different from an LLB in the UK because it's really designed for our Caribbean context. If you do a UK LLB, you are learning English law. I mean, obviously you're going to learn the law of their system. Now, of course, we do have our uh, English history that greatly influences our law, but we really take a more Caribbean approach and contextualize it so that you have a greater ability to relate to what you are learning. Now, don't get me wrong, I totally enjoyed my UK LLB, um, but I do think that there is great value in learning the law from 
the perspective of the society which you plan to live and work in because it really gives you a greater appreciation for uh, how we can use the law as a positive force of change. So while the UK LLB route is not necessarily a bad one, it's one I took and I enjoyed, I do think if you are keen on practicing, working, living in the Caribbean, you want to make positive change, you really need an understanding of how law impacts society. And that's something you cannot get from the UK LLB because it's just not designed to give that kind of contextualization, which we offer on our LLB. Okay. Thank you for that clarification and or the distinction rather between the two experiences. Now a question around CAPE. My application states that I have outstanding documents, specifically CAPE Certificate Unit 2. Shouldn't this be omitted since it was stated that acceptance would be granted with CAPE 1 Certificate 1 due to the current pandemic? So I think perhaps we need to possibly clarify matriculation and entry requirements there. I would invite the Dean to provide a response to that. Okay, so let me say that um, we have not finished our entrance process. While we have been deliberating, we've had several meetings. Um, while we have been deliberating, a decision was taken, as many of you know, that only for this time around because of COVID, if you have if you have good CAPE one unit one results, uh, I'm talking specifically of law, but it applies across the board for the University of the West Indies, and you are currently registered for CAPE two, and it can be other way around. I know some people do CAPE two before CAPE one, but let us say you are one of the units and you are doing the other. For this time only because of COVID, because we know that it's going to be late, the exams are late. In fact, we didn't know when the exams were going to be. Now we know. Taking a decision that we are in a position or we are permitted to allow persons to enter with just the one unit. Now, in terms of the faculty of law, how does that work out? Okay, so we said that we are quite competitive. Usually, you have to have very good grades, the ones and the twos, and or mix up the two. If you had only twos, it might be quite iffy. You may not make it. Um, it would mean that if you have very good keep one um, results, two things might happen. You probably would already have gotten a conditional offer. And if you did, we are in a position now very soon to say to you that's sufficient. That is only this time around. It may never ever happen in our lifetime. So, um, with the assumption that you would um, continue, we can sort of predict that you will be capable of doing the LMP. Those who don't have the conditional offers, we are now still in a position to look at your Cape 1 results or your, your, your whichever unit you have and make a determination as to whether you can, how competitive you are to end. So the bottom line is that we still have to do this process, um, but we are not going to be waiting until you have completed your, your other unit before we make a decision. But we make a decision very soon. Otherwise, it would be too delayed. We wouldn't be. So this is a, one of the strange things that has happened because of COVID. So whatever set you have, whether you did one or two, if it is, a, if it is decent, if it is in line, so normally we say 15 points at the same. If you have already seven points in one of the units, which is half of the 15, it is in good stead to, to enter. So we, we have not actually completed that process. We're doing it very soon. Thank you, Dean. Dean, don't go too far because we have a specific question for you again. Uh, you, Dean, you have been responding to many questions from persons wanting to have an understanding of the alternate routes of entry versus keep. Can you give an idea of some of the students who have entered the LLB from a non keep route? And for the LM, LLB, do you have to have an LLB? Okay. Well, let me ask you the shorter one for the LM. That is, yeah, let me say no. You don't have to have an LLB. Um, if you have a, the LLM, and that is so for many universities, incidentally. If you are professional, you have some other degree. Um, and you can demonstrate some sort of experience in the law 
So for example, lots of people who work in finance and banking, they come up with the law, they come, they come up on legal issues and so on. Or you can demonstrate some sort of relevance who can be taken in, um, accepted, and we have done so with mixed results. I must say some people have done very well, some not so well, but the onus will be on you. So if you are, um, let us say, a finance practitioner and you say, okay, well, I can manage LM, we don't baby you. You have to do your background reading um, because you're a mature professional and let the chips fall where they may. But several people have done it. Now the LLB, it's a, it's a different, we introduced in 2013 some new criteria in order to expand access to legal education. The education wasn't as perhaps equitable or linear as perhaps we would want it to be. So apart from the traditional route, which is the best results at Cape or the best results in your first degree, and I saw somebody in the chat asked, what is the first degree? First degree, we just mean if you've done some other degree, whether it's at the university or any other um, reputable university that we can identify, and you've done well, in our case, done well means upper second and more, so upper second or first, because it's still competitive there, you would most likely get in, right, on the strength of that first degree. Um, the other route is if you have you didn't do so, so well in your first degree. You probably were bordering on an upper second, but then you went and you did a master's and you got a distinction. You will get an extra point. So you may make it a little more tenuous. Apart from that, we created two categories initially. One was for mature students because we felt there are some persons for all kinds of reasons um, when legal education was not as accessible, because now it is more accessible. I don't know if you know this, but when we applied to the, if all of us, uh, well, my deputy dean and myself who did the LLB, it was extremely difficult to get into law in those days. You need to get a quota system. Each country, Trinidad was supposed to be 25 um, applicants, Jamaica was 25 and so on. So may, and of course you have to go to Barbados. So even if you could make it, some people didn't have the money and I'm discovering this one over the day. So it was difficult. Now that we have three faculties, you have a great opportunity just from pure numbers, each of the faculties will take in persons, all right? So we felt that there may be persons out there who missed the boat, as it were, but who are good candidates to be lawyers. And we also believe, and I think all my colleagues give a good indication as to how relevant law is to your society, to your community. So we felt the converse of that is that we should also tap into these experienced persons out there who've been contributing to the society, whatever profession they're in or whatever, and could benefit from doing law and we could benefit from having them in the class and bring a certain um, breath to the class. So we felt we could take in some what we call mature students who can demonstrate that they have the capacity, the experience, and so But in order for it, we can't take everybody, so it's just one or two people who can take. You can apply if you have a decent degree that probably wouldn't get you in on its own. We'll interview you, um, and we have very rigorous interviews, and we will select, we think, are the best two or three uh, to come in. Again, we've had some people who have done very well, but it is spelled on people who didn't do so well, who didn't complete. Because as you heard, the law is quite challenging and then the older you are, you probably have other commitments, family and all of that, all kinds of things. The other one was the law enforcement. Again, because law, of course, deals with criminal justice, with the criminal system, with law enforcement. Anyway, that's part of it. And most persons who are in law enforcement, whether it's the police, the army, the prisoners, the case may be, um, they deal with the law. Many of the prosecutors in court are police officers, for instance. And so there's a, a natural connection. But typically, persons in the police force would not usually have the ones and twos in eight. So again, we felt we could create a, a little niche for those persons and offer them a legal education. So we would take a small number as well. We also to interview. Um, they have to give us the assurance that we can get time off and so on. And then the final category that, well, actually we've created two other categories. We've, we've, we've took, took in one person in terms of disability who can demonstrate that 
their disability, but they were, were probably close to the, the matriculation requirement, but would have had a disability. We took in one person who was doing quite well. And then the McCandle Dagger Scholarship is probably our most innovative and most exciting one. And that is because we felt that, you know, as lawyers, as legal practitioners, we want to be able not just to contribute in terms of projects and so on, but we want to create and fashion lawyers who are not just going to go out there for themselves. Because that's basically you could go and practice for the rest of your life, make lots of money and don't care about anything. Nothing is wrong with that, but it can happen. So we want the, the law and uh, legal education to benefit the society in broader ways and we want to be part of that. So what better we, and especially we want to look at people who may never get the opportunity again to do law because of our very competitive academic qualification. I don't know about you, but I certainly believe that doing well at Cape is not the only, uh, or common entrance or whatever it's called now. Those are not the only indicators of, of either intelligence or capacity. And so, so we want to be able to capture persons who are out there trying to make a difference to the society and who, if they had a, the tool of the law, would be able to do even better. And I think our the scholar that we had, our first and so far only McCandle that scholar, really exemplifies that. He always wanted to do law. He's from C. Lots. Uh, Karim Marcel, as I said, you may have heard him on television, he's a genuine activist. So he said, let us find people out there who are already in activism. He, he's, you know, he's already using the law um, to try to champion justice for people in his area and beyond and so on. That's the kind of person. It doesn't have to be that, that kind of activism. We've had persons who are working in disabilities and so on who applied and who were good contenders as well. So we want to create that space so we will empower persons like these uh, to create the kinds of lawyers so that we have more diversity in our legal um, community. So those are the, the sort of the non-traditional routes to get into law. And you can also transfer, incidentally, if you're in another faculty and you do very well, 3.6 GPA average and above, and you apply to the law faculty, you would normally be able to get into the law faculty. Thank you very much, Dean. And uh, I now have a very specific question. I think we need perhaps some Nigel Bradshaw for this one. For students that were accepted to start this academic year, concerning the medical form and immunization card that has to be submitted. This person is from Grenada and they're concerned if they have to mail the form along with a copy of the immunization card before they arrive to Trinidad or, or can they submit when they arrive on campus? Nigel, okay. yeah, good. Yeah, okay, Winal, thanks for that. Um, the, the question is a very good one, especially um, seeing that we have a number of students in similar situations across all faculties. The, based on everything that has been discussed so far tonight, it might not be the wisest thing to try to attempt or, or to wait until trying to come to Trinidad to bring the form. So the health services unit, which normally receives that, those, that type of documentation, they have also put in, in place an email service that would allow persons to forward certified copies of those documents having scanned them, upload them, uh, uploaded them, and emailed them. The email address for that is um, one that it mightn't seem like, a, like what you'd expect, but it's n-u-r-s-e, nurse, at s-t-a dot u-w-i dot e-d-u. Once again, it's nurse at s-t-a dot u-w-i dot e-d-u. You allow them to um to to make certified copies of the 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 medical well the medical form is dated and signed already so it doesn't need certification the according to how the document is made up for the immunization form if it does not carry a signature you may need to um a signature and a, da a date in terms of all the the records entered you may have to just have it um, passed by a commissioner affidavit, affidavit or anyone like that and have it certified, scanned, uploaded, and emailed to us at the email address provided. Thanks, Nigel. 
a uh, few. I'm, I'm kind of going fast now because I see we are at the eight o'clock mark. This question is about the humanities. Why aren't humanities students given the upper hand into admission into the law faculty? Seeing that science and math students have access to both engineering and medicine faculties and humanities don't. Levels and CSEC subjects. I will just briefly address that. I mean, as we saw, law touches all of life. So even science and math students, they will they'll be able to find their niches in various areas. Um, I don't, th there's no advantage. Um, and also students in humanities, they have access to the faculty of humanities. So that's a separate faculty for that. But in terms of law, it's a sort of a amalgam sort of faculty where every different specialty can apply to law. So I wouldn't say that students in humanities are disadvantaged because they also have a faculty um, based in humanities, but everybody could apply to law with no prerequisite type of subject. In fact, I actually did sciences for A-levels and I applied to law. Okay, so talking about that, um, that stance, I am also seeing that there's a question about students from Tobago being less likely accepted. Can you address that or can you positively? Well, I, I saw that Dr. Ku addressed that in the chat, so perhaps another question. And can I just, pop in, and in, chat. Okay. Can I just yes, pop in and say that it's actually the opposite? We love to have to be good students. In fact, we've had some excellent ones with first class honors. And while I'm at it, we want to have more regional students. So please apply. We really don't want to just have Trinidad and Tobago as much as I love Trinidadian Trin Trin and Tobago. We want to have regional students as well. <laughs> Thanks for that, Dean. And I want to ask our viewers, if you haven't had a question answered or addressed, please post it now because we will be winding down pretty soon. Some of the questions that are in the chat, we still ask them, you know, orally, to, just in case persons missed it because people join us at different points on the, um, on the session. There's a question about transferring. Uh, suppose I'm a student wishing to transfer from the law faculty of Cave Hill to St. Augustine. Is that an option to continue from year two onwards to St. Augustine? At St. Augustine, sorry. I would invite the Dean to respond to that question. Yes, give me all the hard ones right there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I could respond, um, but I don't want to get anything wrong. Right, you want to encourage how to put this delicately. It has a long <laughs> history. Um, it's not so simple to transfer from one campus to the other. Usually to Kayville, to the Mona. Now, since we started the faculty, we have actually been getting the so-called um, top performing students, right? So we, we have first preference, they come to us. So those who don't, typically those who don't get into St. Augustine, we get into Kayville. And then often, often, but less so these days, they try to apply and to get back in. So it's like going through the back door, let us put it that way. So, but it also means, of course, that if you transfer from Cave Hill, then Cave Hill campus does not get the fees for you. And you know, all campuses have to be competitive. So you don't want to be seen to be poaching the students of Cave Hill either. So that is, has a bit of a history from that point of view. So it's a very um, slender route. Usually, if you have uh, good medical reasons, you will be permitted to transfer, but you have to get the permission from the Cavill campus, or if you happen to be in Mona, the Mona campus. Once they give the okay, then they would send it to us and we will consider it. And if you do um, get the transfer and one or two people have succeeded, then yes, you can go seamlessly because it's one university, one UE, and one degree. So if you had gone up to second year, you would continue with it. Thank you, Dean. Now a question regarding uh, entry, would work experience and a professional diploma be accepted for entry? I can answer. Um, work experience and a professional diploma, we, we do allow um, some exceptions to mature students who have a previous degree, but they also have substantial work experience and professional experience. So we 
but it's very, very few students. But of course, your work experience during professional development must be extensive. So those students would have to apply, but also submit their, their CV that evidences that experience, and then they could be interviewed. Okay. And uh, what I would say is possibly a final question. In the future, is there any hope of offering a partial distance learning? Well, um, and I would like to invite just Dr. Ku to answer a question, just to make sure that everyone gets a turn. Justin Ku. I just repeat the question, please. Are there any hopes of partial distance learning in the future? Um, I think the Dean mentioned it earlier. It's doubtful because this idea was um, started at Cahill, but then subsequently it stopped. So it's unlikely that we go um, part-time in the future. Okay, yeah, thanks. And to, to, to finalize with application dates, for those who have not applied yet. You want me to take that one now? Yes, please. Okay, um, once again, we re reiterate for undergraduate applications and also to for postgraduate applications. Friday at 4 p.m., we shut the door on applications to the University of the West Indies for persons seeking enrollment for the next academic year, which begins in September. Um, and remember, the entire application for both processes is entirely online now. And you are encouraged to visit our website, um, start the process of reviewing the information via our faculties and academic information. Um, it's pretty, the marketing and communications team has done a wonderful job working with the faculties to be able to uh, um, highlight and elaborate all the information that you need at the websites of the faculties in terms of the programs and so on. Especially for the faculty of law, it's very, very easy. I mean, it's one undergraduate degree, so it's pretty straightforward. Um, we are here also to answer all your questions. Remember, I will answer your questions within 48 hours or less. Um, and we look forward to ensuring that the, the process to get to new here is as smooth as it can be in these challenging times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nigel. And before we wrap, I, I don't know if you, if you want to have final words from some of your colleagues on the panel. Thank you. I would just like to invite Mrs. Janetta G to speak a little bit about the LLM legal drafting program. I know that that's a specialty area and she obliged by sitting on the panel. Have you any like words that you could say about what the program entails? There was a previous question and what students should um, expect. Hi, good, good evening, everyone. So with respect to the legislative drafting, um, that's a very exciting program. Uh, it is also one that most people don't know about. A question came in on the chat, chat as, what is legislative drafting? And uh, basically, once you're studying law, you st all the laws that you will be studying would have been drafted by someone. So if you're doing any subject, criminal law, so you have the evidence yeah. act, um, every single law you could possibly think about. Somebody would have drafted it at some time. So there's actually um, a department in every country that drafts laws. And um, as I said, this is not an area that people know about. So the master's is one that is a specialized master's. And uh, um, someone had asked about opportunities. So this area is an area where being so specialized, there are very few persons in the world that actually draft law. And uh, this is also an area where you can move within the CARICOM or the Commonwealth to, to work in different drafting departments in the governments of different countries so that you get that experience. Um, so it's, it's important. It is one of those that I tell my students uh, mental gymnastics because as the deputy dean had said you cover everything when you study in law it it, it um, touches every aspect of life and uh, if you're drafting you know we draft every single thing that you can think about so from environmental law banking criminal law recently we did interception of communication which is a big one and very controversial um, you know, we did things on cannabis, 
um, recently domestic violence amendments to that act and uh, it varies so that you have to be thinking when you're doing this course especially how does it affect every other piece of law and uh, that's why it's a mental gymnastics so it's for me i love it um clearly it is my passion i love drafting and i've been doing it for 20 years and uh, um and i also had the opportunity to do it in another country so that it is possible to for students to look at it as something that they can do um, later on. So of course you have to have a, an LLB before um, you could even enter a drafting department. And um, usually you have to be a, an attorney at law, call to the bar. But however, um, as the deputy dean said, you know, there are think tanks and other opportunities that even if you may not be called to the bar, but you have a law degree and a master's in drafting and that's a specific skill in drafting, then you have other opportunities. So possibly, as I said, throughout the Commonwealth, um, UN, the um, different things like the FAO, Food and Drug Association, Food and FAO, <laughs> Food and Agricultural Organization, um, all these acronyms that's one of the things in law too all these acronyms but it's it's exciting it's it's um very specialized so it's one of those things you have to love also um many people stay away from it uh, because it's a again it's a lot of reading all law is a lot of reading but this also means a lot of writing and a lot of research is a, a big component of it thank you Thank you very much. Okay, so as we bring today's session to a close, I would like to invite the Dean, Professor Antoine, to deliver her closing remarks. Well, it's late, so let me just say thank you to everyone. Thank you to my Deputy Dean, who a great job um, organizing this, and to you in marketing, and to all our participants, and of course, all of the panelists. Um, believe it or not, it's the first, first time I've, I've actually seen Kathyan and she spoke so well. I'm just going to do it. So thank you, everybody. I do hope we answer your main questions. Um, you can mail us. We, we don't have the questions to answer every single one if you can, but go on the website and please apply and we will, be, um, we will attend to you as soon as possible. As I said, it's been a difficult period for us with the COVID. But now that we have the green light, we'll very soon be sending out um, firm offers um, for those who have a right. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Dean. And viewers, if you're interested in learning about LLB, well, we have one more other open day. And that brings down the curtain in our series of open days. And that's started for Monday, July 6th. It's the Faculty of Humanities and Education. And you can find out more about these sessions at uh, sta.ub.edu slash virtual open day. So thank you for being with us this evening. It was a pleasure to host you. Remember to look out for an email from us where we will share this recording. And you'll also get a copy of some of additional resources and e-copy that is. And so from all of us at St. Augustine, my colleagues, we wish you a good night and we look forward to welcoming you to the St. Augustine campus in September. Good night.